Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, I'm very happy to have with us Dr. Andre Boris. Andre got his PhD at the University of Kent, studying phosphorus and sulfur-centered heterocyclic radicals under the supervision of Ewan Clark in the Functional Materials Group. He subsequently carried out a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Edinburgh, working on phosphorus boron heterocycles in the Cowley Group, followed by another fellowship at the University of York, focused on fluorescent phosphols in the Baumgartner and Caputo Groups. Currently, he's a postdoctoral researcher in the Hevia group at the University of Bern, studying metallic 8 complexes in catalysis. Andre has also created a really great online resource called the Schlenklein Survival Guide, and today he's going to give us an overview of some different Schlenk techniques. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Andre. Thank you very much for joining us. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Matt, for the invitation and introduction. Today, I will be talking about Schlenklein chemistry and the resources that I have created over at the Schlenklein Survival Guide to help students and other researchers master air and moisture sensitive chemistry. Now many of the reagents that we use are sensitive towards atmospheric air and moisture. Despite this, they are used widely in industry for example, organometallic reagents are widely used for a range of stoichiometric transformations or to initiate many polymerization reactions. In research labs, air and moisture sensitive species have countless applications and they are not just limited to synthetic organic or inorganic chemistry. This means that specialized techniques must be applied to safely manipulate and prepare air and moisture sensitive compounds, and this is why we need strength lines. Strength lines consist of a vacuum manifold which is attached to a vacuum pump and an inert gas manifold which is attached to a source of dry and purified inert gas. The two manifolds are connected by ground glass double oblique stopcocks or Teflon taps which allow connected flasks to be easily placed under vacuum or an inert gas atmosphere. A liquid nitrogen trap is situated before the vacuum pump to condense any solvent or other volatile species. A manometer or vacuum gauge can also be used to monitor the vacuum pressure within the shrink line. The inert gas leaves the shrink line via a bubbler which provides a pressure relief system as well as allowing the inert gas flow to be monitored. The most commonly used bubblers are oil bubblers due to their simplicity and low cost, but they do have their disadvantages, including low working pressures and vulnerability to suck back. Overpressure bubblers, shown in the middle, are designed to prevent oil suck back and to allow higher inert gas pressures to be safely reached and used on the shrink line. Mercury bubblers, as shown on the right, can also be used but are now less popular due to health concerns. Shrink lines are supported by lattice lab frames that are typically secured to the back wall of a fume hood. It is recommended to have the clamps and boss heads oriented such that the weight is supported by the static jaw of the clamp. Many different joints may be accounted on the shrink line, including greaseless o-ring ball and socket joints, the standard greased ground glass joint, or even ground glass joints sealed with vacuum wax. Glassware is used for the manipulation and preparation of air and moisture sensitive compounds are generally stored in ovens above 100 degrees Celsius to remove any traces of water. Shank flasks have a built-in gas inlet sidearm which fits a ground glass stopcock and a ground glass opening to fit a stopper or rubber septum. The stopper and stopcock are greased prior to use to ensure an airtight and uniform seal and the flask is then evacuated under vacuum. For very sensitive reactions, it may be necessary to flame dry glassware under vacuum prior to use. After 5 to 10 minutes, the flask is then slowly backfilled with inert gas and then subsequently put back under vacuum. This is classed as one cycle and this is typically repeated three times to ensure that the shrink flask is free of air and moisture. The hydrous and degas solvents are commonly transferred from storage ampules into reaction class by cannular transfer. The Teflon tap on the ampule is first replaced by a rubber septum under a flow of inert gas and a stopper is replaced on the shrink flask with a rubber septum too. A cannula, typically made of stainless steel or Teflon, is pierced through the septum of the solvent ampule and purged with inert gas before being inserted through the septum on the receiving flask. A bleed needle is inserted into the septum of the receiving flask and a stopcock is, is closed to the inert gas to establish a pressure differential. The cannula is then lowered into the solvent to begin the transfer. It may be necessary to increase the grass pressure within the shrink line to initiate the transfer. 
Once the desired volume of a solvent has been transferred, the cannula is raised above the solvent level and the stopcock on the receiving flask is opened to inert gas. The bleed needle can be removed, followed by the cannula from both septa, which are then replaced by the stopper and Teflon cap respectively. The same method can be used to transfer solutions or other liquids from two different flasks. Solids can be isolated or removed using a filter cannula. These can be easily prepared using a flat-ended cannula, Teflon tape and a glass microfiber filter paper. The same method as described previously for a cannula transfer is then applied, but higher inert gas pressures may be required to enable the filtration. For the removal of fine solids such as inorganic salts, it is recommended to perform a filtration through sea light. The filter stick is first assembled by placing oven dried sea light into a glass scented filter stick and connecting it to a receiving shrink flask. A shrink cap or Viking helmet is placed on the top and the filter stick is then cycled onto the shrink line. Caution is required when backfilling with inert gas to ensure that the sea light layer is not disturbed. The reaction mixture can then be transferred into the filter stick by a cannula transfer and a partial static vacuum can be applied to the receiving flask to initiate the filtration. The solids and sea light can be washed and extracted with an appropriate solvent and then the filter stick can be replaced with a greased glass stopper to enable further manipulations with the solid free filtrate. Filter sticks are also a convenient way to isolate the fine solids. In these cases the sea light is emitted and once the filtration and washing steps are complete, the solid can be dried directly on the frit under vacuum prior to isolation in the glove box. Schlenk lines are equipped with high vacuum pumps allowing solvents and other volatiles to be easily removed directly on the Schlenk line. When removing large volumes of solvent or particularly nasty or corrosive volatiles, it is recommended to use a secondary external liquid nitrogen trap. Once a solvent has been removed in vacuo, the Schlenk flask can be taken directly into the glove box or cycled back onto the Schlenk line to be filled with inert gas for further manipulations. NMR samples containing air or moisture sensitive species are often prepared in J. Young's NMR tubes. Using a suitable adapter, this is first cycled onto the Schlenk line and then an aliquot of the reaction mixture is transferred into the NMR tube by syringe or cannula transfer. Under a flow of inert gas, the Teflon tap is secured onto the NMR tube. This can be directly analysed using no D methods or evaporated dryness and redissolved in the deuterated solvent. To remove solvents from a J. Young's NMR tube, it is first attached directly to the shrink line tubing using the tapered glass adapter that is supplied with the tubes. The tubing is placed under vacuum and the NMR tube is submerged in the drew of liquid nitrogen to freeze the sample. The Teflon tap is twisted to open the cap and evacuate the headspace of the NMR tube. After two to three minutes under vacuum, whilst frozen, the Teflon tap is sealed and the sample is thawed. This freezing and vacuum process is repeated, but now the sample is removed from the liquid nitrogen with the Teflon tap open to allow the solvent to be slowly evaporated under vacuum. Once all of the solvent has been removed, the NMR tube can be backfilled with inert gas sealed and then taken into a glove box or cycled back onto the strength line to be redissolved in the deuterated solvent. Solvents, solutions and liquids can be degassed using the freeze pump 4 method. The liquid is sealed in the strength flask or other suitable flask and frozen in the dewer of liquid nitrogen. Once completely frozen, the headspace is evacuated under vacuum for five or so minutes depending on the volume. The flask is sealed and the liquid is allowed to completely fall. This process is repeated two more times and then the flask can be backfilled with inert gas. Solvents and liquid reagents with relatively low boiling points can be dried and purified by static vacuum distillation. This method is performed in a closed system which minimises evaporative loss. The solvent is first stirred over a suitable desiccant and then it is degassed using the freeze pump 4 method. While sealed under vacuum on the last freeze pump four cycle, it is connected to a greaseless distillation bridge with a receiving flask. The transfer flask is refrozen in liquid nitrogen and the entire system is open to the vacuum to build a static vacuum within the system. The top stopcock can then be closed 
and the dura of liquid nitrogen is removed from the transfer flask and moved to the receiving flask. As the liquid falls, it will slowly and steadily evaporate and condense in the receiving flask. Once the distillation is complete, the Teflon taps can be sealed and the flask can be cycled back onto the shrink line or into a glove box. For high boiling liquids and oils, it is more common to perform a dynamic vacuum distillation for purification. A distillation bridge connected to a receiving flask is first cycled onto the shrink line and then connected to the flask containing the crude material under a flow of inert gas. The stopcock on the heating flask is closed and a vacuum is then slowly applied from the receiving flask stopcock. The liquid is then heated to the desired temperature and the receiving flask is placed in an ice or liquid nitrogen bath to condense the purified liquid. After the distillation, the system is warmed or cooled back to room temperature, then backfilled with inert gas for further manipulations. Pyrophoric reagents and other air and moisture sensitive species are supplied and stored in bottles with sure seals or other penetrable septa. These must be fed with inert gas whilst dispensing the reagent to ensure a positive pressure of inert gas is maintained in the bottle. A syringe and needle are first purged with inert gas ideally using the septum on the receiving shrink flask and then penetrated into the reagent bottle. Slightly more liquid than is required is withdrawn into the syringe and then it is inverted and depressed to remove the gas bubble and reach the desired volume. It can then be transferred into the receiving shrink flask. Glove boxes are primarily used for the isolation, storage and manipulation of air and moisture sensitive solids. They can also be used for wet chemistry, provided that the glove box is equipped with suitable solvent filters. Glassware and equipment is introduced into the glove box using the antechambers. Similar to connecting glassware to a shrink line, free vacuum inert gas cycles are required to ensure that no air or moisture is introduced into the glove box. It is still possible to perform air and moisture sensitive reactions without a shrink line. An inert gas source, typically nitrogen, is fed into a flask equipped with a rubber septum via a balloon or inert gas manifold. It is purged before use using a bleed needle to flush away air in the reaction flask. Anhydrous and degas solvents, which can be purchased directly, can be introduced into the flask by a cannula transfer or by syringe. This method is more common when air and moisture sensitive reagents are required where the final product is not sensitive. For more information and specific details, please visit the Schlenk Line Survival Guide. You can also find product and equipment recommendations, along with synthetic procedures and Schlenk Line safety information. A PDF copy of the guide is also available, and new guides and information is added periodically. I would like to thank Dr. Ewan Clark for Schlenk Line training, and for everyone else who has provided feedback and support to the website. Thanks again for Matt for the invitation and finally for you for watching this presentation. Thank you for tuning in for another episode of Synthesis Workshop and thank you very much to Andre for joining us to talk about Schlenk Technique. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out. To support this initiative, help us out by telling your peers about this resource. Check our webpage, synthesis-workshop.com or follow us on Twitter to stay up to date. See you all next time.